This conference will now be recorded. So we'll continue today with absorption spectroscopy from where we left off last class. Last class, we uh, were discussing about wavelength selectors. And uh, we have seen there are two types of wavelength selectors, basically fil filters and monochromatics. We have also discussed last class about filters. They are again of two types, interference filters and absorption filters. Interference filters can be used in both UV and visible region, uh, whereas absorption filters are restricted to you be to use only in visible region. Moreover, uh, interference filters are better in the sense they give narrower band of wavelengths, whereas uh, absorption filters have a much wider bandwidth. We have seen what is effective bandwidth, and that's a way of carrying. Uh, class uh, categorizing a particular uh, wavelength selector, whether it's a good one, not so good, or a poor wavelength selector. So if the bandwidth is smaller, we say it's a good quality wavelength selector. So comparing interference filters with absorption filters, interference filters are much better. On an average, we can say the effective bandwidth is around 10 nanometers. If you see the absorption filters, the uh, uh, bandwidth actually varies over a larger range, about 50 to 230 nanometers. So on an average, uh, we could say, uh, suppose we take the low 30 to 230, so most of them fall in the 50 nanometer range. But it's much greater than that of uh, interference filters, which is only 10 nanometers. Uh, other uh, advantage of interference filter, what we saw was uh, the intensity of radiation coming through an interference filter is much greater than what comes out of an absorption filter because the absorption filter uh, also absorbs much of the desired radiation. And usually the output or transmittance is uh, just about 10, per, uh, sorry, uh, just about 1% or even lesser at the band maximum. So this was what uh, we saw last time. We uh, compared uh, the two filters. Uh, now, today we'll start with monochromatis. So what are monochromatis? And uh, before we go into uh, the different types of monochromatis, uh, what are the co basic components of a monochromatis? So all monochromatis will have an entrance slit, a collimating lens or mirror to make the radiation parallel, a dispersive device which spreads out or disperses the different wa wavelengths, um, this could be a prism or grating. Then you have a focusing element, again, a, a lens or a mirror. This will converge the radiation now, onto a focal plane, which will have an exit slit. So the fifth component is the exit slit on the focal plane. On a planar surface, um, the exit slit will be there, and through the exit slit, the radiation will exit out of the monochromator and then naturally be incident on the next component, that's the sample cell containing the sample. So now we have two slits, entrance slit and exit slit, and in between them, we have two uh, lens or mirror. One uh, is the collimating lens because we want parallel radiation being incident on the dispersive device. Uh, and the other, the parallel radiation coming out of the dispersive device is focused onto the exit slit. Now, the main component here is the dispersive device, which could be a prism or grating. And based on what is present in the monochromata, we say monochromatas are of two types, prisms or gratings. Actually, it's one of the components in the monochromata, which could be of two types, prisms or gratings. So we'll see both of these. And the major advantage of a monochromatic compared to a prism is that you can continuously vary the wavelength 
from one uh, from the start of a particular region to the end of the region say for in if you're dealing with visible right from 380 to 780 you can continuously vary the wavelength but in case of filters you will have to put in uh, filters and you don't get filters for every wavelength in a particular electromagnetic spectral region you will be having one uh, filter which covers a range of wavelengths then you replace that with another filter which covers the next range of wavelength so about four to five uh, filters maximum are supplied with a filter instrument but monochromata you can scan without changing anything you can scan over a number of wavelengths and that makes scanning very easy with monochromatic instruments so we start off with prisms the isolation of different wavelengths in a prism monochromatic is based on the fact that refractive index of materials is different for radiation of different wavelengths so what this means is if you say a uh, refractive index of this material is so and so, you have measured at a particular wavelength. So if you change the wavelength, then the refractive index will also be different. It all depends upon the angle of ref uh, refraction. So when you have a particular wavelength, say lambda 1, it will refract at angle theta 1. If you have a different wavelength, lambda 2, it will refract through the same uh, prism at a different wavelength, theta 2. Theta 1 will be different from theta 2. This is what this states. So since the angle of refraction will be different, naturally the refractive index of the material is different for different wavelengths. Now shorter wavelengths are refracted more than longer wavelengths. So angle of refraction is more for shorter wavelengths than for longer wavelengths. And prisms give non-linear dispersion because uh, each uh, wavelength, different wavelengths are refracted to different extents. So we say prisms give non-linear dispersion. The separation between the wavelengths is not the same for all wavelengths. Hence, since shorter wavelengths are refracted more, the separation or the resolution of the shorter wavelengths is much better. And therefore, prisms are more effective for shorter wavelengths. They're not so suitable for longer wavelengths. So if you compare UV visible and IR, UV are the shorter wavelengths. So for UV uh, radiations, prisms would serve quite well. For visible, they are OK. But for IR, there are more problems because the individual wavelengths are not well separated or not well resolved. And therefore, you will have to use a very small slit width to isolate one wavelength. And uh, IR uh, sources have their own problem. Their intensity is not so high, so you cannot use a small uh, slit. Uh, you'll have to keep the slit larger. And that is why prisms are rarely seen and nowadays almost not seen in IR instruments as wavelength selectors. They have another purpose called the order sorter. So here you see some pictorial representations. You have just seen that shorter wavelengths are refracted more. Here you can see all the Vibcure colors and uh, these are the shorter wavelengths, red being the longer wavelength. If you see the amount of refraction, the deviation is less for red whereas the deviation is more. You also see there are two refractions, one at first surface and another at the second surface. So two refractions will help in resolving all the different wavelengths in case of a prism. But the longer wavelengths are not as well resolved as the shorter wavelengths. Now the other thing is the prism that we are using should not absorb the radiation. So the prism should be made up of a material that is transparent to the radiation we are using. Glass prisms can be used for visible regions since glass is transparent to visible region and quartz prisms are used for UV regions. So here uh, is the setup uh, we have in our instrument. You have the full monochromatic setup. Here you have the entrance slit, 
So from the source, radiation is entering the monochromator through the entrance slit. It's a divergent beam from the source. So it hits the collimating lens or mirror can also be used. Here I have shown the example of a lens. So it's a collimating lens. What is a collimating lens? A lens which makes the incident radiation parallel. So now you have drawn two parallel lines. You have to be very careful when you draw these optical diagrams. Please stick to what rigidly to the conditions. So this is a divergent beam. This becomes a parallel beam. So these two lines should be parallel. Next, it hits the prism on the first surface. So there is a deviation. There is refraction. There is also dispersion. Okay. Now, considering that this original radiation is made up of two wavelengths, lambda 1 and lambda 2. So there is a separation of lambda 1 and lambda 2. Our initial very slight separation does take place here. But you see that both of them have deviated to the lower side in both the cases. It is not same. This, of course, the dashed line is deviated to a lesser extent than the solid line, which clearly indicates solid line is a shorter wavelength than the dashed line. So now here uh, it comes across the second phase of the prism. And here there will be a further refraction. So again, you have to show a deviation. Again, towards the downside because it is getting refracted the same side. This second deviation spreads the two wavelengths more apart. They were almost uh, like very close to one another. Now you can see them quite uh, separate. So this is the effect of double refraction at the two faces of the prism. But to ensure that wherever you're drawing, the dashed line should be parallel to each other and the solid line should be parallel to each other. They continue to be parallel till they hit the focusing lens. The purpose of this lens is to actually converge the radiation. So a particular wavelength radiation, say lambda 2, which is the shorter wavelength, is converged to a given uh, point, whereas this is the focal point, and uh, the dashed line is converged to another point on a plane surface. This is focal plane AB, and on this plane surface, you get the focal points of lambda 2 and lambda 1. Lambda 2 focal point actually falls on the exit slit in the focal plane AB. And so it will exit out of the monochromator. But lambda 1 focal point is at some point on the focal plane, not on the exit slit. And hence it gets lost there. So it does not come out of the monochromator. That's how we manage to separate the wavelengths. So out of the two wavelengths, lambda 1 and lambda 2 entering the monochromator, it's only lambda 2 which exits from the monochromator and is incident on your sample. So hence we can say bending or refraction of the radiation at the two surfaces of a prism leads to dispersion. So this is how you get monochromatic radiation by the use of a prism. Now, uh, this is another representation. You have all the spread and then there is a further spread. You have the different colors. On this side, you have infrared. So this is red, orange. These are the longer wavelengths and these are the shorter wavelengths. Longer wavelengths are closer to one another. Shorter wavelengths are much widely uh, spread out. Now, here you have the uh, slit. So radiation which is passing through here would be very long. Now you want blue light to pass through the slit. So the wavelength corresponding to blue light is supposed to pass through the slit. How do you do? Because this focal plane is not moved. Slit can only be widened or reduced. But you cannot move the slit down or up. So what has to be done is this prism, which is the dispersive device, is rotated. When you rotate, say you rotate in this way, then all these radiations will go up and it will so happen that blue will fall exactly at the exit slit. So you have to rotate the prism 
till blue rises up till here to get the blue radiation falling on your sample. So uh, prisms spread out the spectrum and particular wavelength can be chosen by rotating the prism. This is how it is operated. Next, we come to the more important type of monochromata, and that's gratings. So first, we need to understand what are gratings. You may have studied this in IR. So uh, a little similar, same type, uh, but a slight uh, difference, which uh, actually ensures that IR gratings cannot be used in UV visible uh, instruments. Gratings consist of a large number of parallel and closely spaced grooves ruled on a hard polished surface with a suitably shaped diamond tool. So what you have is uh, you have something like, say this is your grating. So how uh, you will create the grating is you will draw very closely spaced grooves with a diamond shaped tool at regular intervals uh, parallel lines will be drawn they will be very closely spaced and uh, when you draw this actually it will form a groove so if you see the cross section it will look something like so this is where you drew the line so there will be a depression so if you take, say, moist uh, cement and you draw uh, with a sharp tool, you will see a groove being created. That's how gratings are made. So you have a number of parallel and closely spaced grooves that are ruled on a hard polished surface with a suitably shaped diamond tool. This polished surface is for one type of grating called the reflective grating. But if it is a transmission grating, then it is not polished. It is a transparent surface. Okay, So there, uh, the gratings are of two types, reflection gratings and transmission gratings. Most gratings are replica gratings because master gratings or original gratings are very expensive to be used in instruments. Cost of instrument will go up drastically so to avoid that replica gratings or duplication of the master grating is done those are the replica gratings they are used because it's very difficult to create master gratings imagine see if you see the dimensions you will realize this you have uv and visible region gratings have a 300 to 2000 gross per millimeter and uh, roughly um, on an average, because we take the center region, commonly it is 1,200 to 1,400 grooves per millimeter. Try to imagine a millimeter is, a very, is the smallest division on your scale. Within that, you have to draw 1,200 lines. So it's not easy. And it has to be drawn accurately to the same depth the groove has to be created. The angle of the grooves should be the same. The distance between the grooves should be the same. And all these grooves should be parallel to one another. So all this are done in a grating. And that's why to make it is quite difficult. You need a very sophisticated technology to do that. And hence uh, also becomes naturally expensive. And that's why uh, replica gratings, which are created from the original grating, which are duplication of the original gratings, are generally used in instruments. IR, as you can see, the number of grooves is much lesser. This is because IR radiation, the wavelength is much longer. So the number of grooves are just 10 to 200 grooves per millimeter. And that is why a grating suitable for IR will not do for UV visible instruments. In general, a grating um, which is chosen for the shorter wavelengths will not be suitable for longer wavelengths. And that for longer wavelengths will not be suitable for shorter wavelengths and that is why in a combination instrument usually we don't have 2000 grooves per millimeter but we take an in-between value between 300 to 2000 and commonly it is 1200 to 1400 grooves per millimeter that is generally used
So the types of diffra uh, diffraction gratings, you have uh, types of gratings. First is reflection and another is transmission. So grating is said to be a transmission or reflection grating according to whether it is transparent or mirrored. That is, whether it is ruled on glass or on a thin metal film deposited on glass blank. That's what I told you when I gave you initially the explanation of a grating on a hard polished surface means a metal film has been deposited. Then it would result in reflection grating. Instead of having a hard polished surface, if you have a hard transparent surface that is made up of glass, then you will have a transmission grating. So a plain transmission grating can be easily constructed by drawing a large number of closely spaced lines on a plain transparent plate like glass with a sharp diamond point. So the same way what I told you in for general uh, gratings, this is done on glass. The important part is this one. The lines on the plate are opaque to line and the spaces between these lines are transparent. So the radiation that falls on the transparent uh, portion on the glass will actually go through and uh, the radiation um, that falls on the grow will be partially refracted. The refraction produce uh, this is uh, refraction produces reinforcement and this occurs when radiation transmitted through grating reinforces with the partially refracted radiation and, and uh, where does this take place when uh, the radiation is falling on the grove which is not transparent the wavelength of radiation um produced by transmission grating can be expressed by the following equation lambda equals d sine theta by m where lambda is the wavelength of light produced d equals one by lines per centimeter theta is the angle at deflection or diffraction and m is the order one two three so we'll see about the order a little later I will show you the same picture and I'll try to explain. So at this point, uh, when you have, say, at this angle, you will get first order radiation, second order, third order, fourth order, all at this angle. But the wavelengths will be different. So here you can see the radiation falling here on the grating. So whenever it falls on the grooves, it gets refracted. And when uh, it falls, because the angle at which it falls will be different. So it will uh, go through, but it will go through at a different angle. So if uh, the, uh, the, they both are of the same wavelength, there is reinforcement. Dispersion with a reflection grating, um, which... Uh, here you have a reflection grating being shown in this picture. This is something like similar to prism. How actually the dispersion takes place? So here in a monochromator, which uses a grating as the dispersive device. So here you have the entrance slit and this is your exit slit. In between you have the collimating. Here I have shown mirrors. So collimating device and here you have the focusing element. In between those two, you have the grating. This is a reflection grating. So it's not going to pass through, it is going to reflect back. So here you have the radiation coming from the source entering the entrance slit of the monochromator. It's a divergent beam. And since it's optical diagram, you have to draw these arrows indicating which direction the light is moving. So here it hits the concave mirrors and uh, uh, the radiation becomes parallel. From here, the radiation is parallel. But you can see again here lambda 1, lambda 2 are the two wavelengths in the instant radiation. They are not separated at this point. Once they hit the reflection grating, when they are reflected, then uh, they are actually, the wavelengths are dispersed also. They get separated. So both of them are dispersed. But when you draw these lines, the dashed lines are one wavelength. It is lambda 1. And the solid lines are the second wavelength, which is lambda 2. The solid lines should be parallel to one another and the dashed lines should be parallel to one another. 
but the dashed line will not be parallel to the solid line because the angle at which they are reflected is different. Now they hit the next mirror that is another concave mirror which converges the radiations of a particular wavelength to a focal point. And here also lambda 1 focal point is here. Lambda 2 is here. So this is your focal plane which has it uh, has an exit slit. According to this diagram, you see lambda 2 being focused on the exit slit. So it will be lambda 2 that goes through out of the monochromator and falls on the next component that would be the sample cell. Lambda 1, however, does not reach the sample. If you want lambda 1 to fall on the sample, you will have to rotate your grating so the grating if it is rotated like this then lambda 2 will shift onto this side of the focal plane and lambda 1 will shift right onto the exit slit so again here like prism was rotated here the grating has to be rotated to get different wavelengths onto the exit slit so diffraction of radiation at the reflected surface leads to dispersion in case of gratings it's another pictorial representation with colors so that it becomes more clear to you. The two wavelengths are colored differently. You have blue and red, uh, two different colors, and shorter wavelength, longer wavelength. And you can see the diffraction here is another white light falling on the grating and uh, diffraction helping to spread all the different colors of white light at each incident point. Hope that makes it very clear. The ray which is incident on grating gets reinforced with reflected ray and hence resulting radiation has wavelength which is governed by the equation m lambda equals b sin i plus minus sin r. So what is lambda? It's the wavelength of light produced. b is the grating spacing. Here you can see this is the spacing between the grows. I is the angle of incidence. Suppose, say, this is the incident light, this is the normal to the grating, then this is I. R is the angle of reflection. So, here it is incident and this is the way it gets reflected. So, this is angle of reflection. M is the order of uh, radiation. You also, see the blaze angle. I hope you know that it's the grow normal because this is the angle of the groove, 90 degrees to that is the blaze angle. So if the uh, radiation that is reflected will be reinforcing the incident radiation if it has a wavelength corresponding to this, okay, corresponding to this particular equation. This equation will be suitable for uh, a particular wavelength. So whichever wavelength satisfies that, that will get reinforced by this grating. Now, a little more about gratings to understand the working of gratings. Grooves act as scattering centers for rays falling on the grating. Equal dispersion or linear dispersion of all wavelengths of a given order. That means, equal dispersion means all the wavelengths are separated from one another to the same extent, by the same extent. Say they are separated by angle theta, lambda 1 and lambda 2. Then lambda 2 and lambda 3 will also be separated by angle theta. Lambda 3 and lambda 4 by angle theta. So they, that's called equal dispersion. Resolving power of grating is better than that of prism. Resum, resolving power refers to the separation of individual wavelengths. Our individual wavelengths are separated much better by gratings than by prisms. That's why we say the resolving power is better. Intensity of radiation reflected by the grating varies with the wavelength. So it's always like because I uh, gave you the two uh, equations where you have wavelength equal to, uh, say the last one was m lambda equals b sin i plus minus sin r. So this sin i for a given sin i and sin r, um, you will add a given grating spacing and a given order. 
uh, it will be satisfied on, uh, only by one wavelength. So that wavelength then will have the maximum intensity. So as you move away from the wavelength, from that wavelength to shorter or longer wavelengths, that is suppose that wavelength is 500, you go to 499 or 501, you will see the intensity of radiation will slightly decrease. If you move still further away, say 502 and 498, you'll see the intensity still reducing. That's what I meant by intensity of radiation reflected by grating varies with the wavelength. And which wavelength is going to come out with the greater intensity? That is wavelength of maximum intensity depends on the angle from which the radiation is reflected from the surface of the groove in the grating. So in other words, the angle at which the groove is made is very important. The angle from which the radiation is reflected will decide which wavelength will have maximum intensity. And as you move away from that wavelength, you will see the intensity goes on reducing. Grooves are made at specific angles for specific wavelengths because angle is very important. It will decide which wavelength will come out with maximum intensity. So if you are targeting the shorter wavelengths, you have to make an angle suitable for that. So, they are, uh, so that's why we say grooves are made at specific angles for specific wavelength regions. Uh, in short, suppose we say UV visible and IR. IR angles are very different from UV visible. The number of lines are lesser over a certain uh, area. And therefore, the angles will also be different. It's something like, just show you here, within this area, you can have this mark. Or you have multiple uh, like this over this area. Now here, you could also have only a single so the ang this angle this angle is different from this angle if you're going to the same depth this angle will be different because you're covering a shorter distance here here you're covering larger distance so this is what happens in ir you have fewer lines in a given area in uv visible you have more lines drawn and more grows so the angle will be different Original gratings are expensive as they are difficult to prepare, hence replica gratings are used. Preparation of a replica grating. How do you prepare now? It's uh, something like preparing from a mold, simply preparing from a mold. So evaporate a film of aluminium onto a master grating after it has been coated with a parting agent that permits ready separation of the aluminium from the master. You have a master grating. First, you coat it with a parting agent, something which will help separation. And then you evaporate a film of aluminium on that coating. Then after you evaporate a film, you attach a glass plate to the aluminium and lift the grooved film from the master mold. Because of that parting agent, you can just lift it. Once it cools, you just lift it uh, with the help of the glass plate. Now, aluminium film is very thin and that is why we attach a glass plate so that you can lift the aluminium film without breaking it. So, the glass gets stuck to the aluminium film and when you remove the glass, the film comes with the glass. But the angles, everything are duplicated as it was on the master grating. So we have seen about the advantages of gratings in the previous slide. This also gives you all the advantages. It gives you equal dispersion. The resolution of the different wavelengths from a grating is very good. The intensity of radiation is also quite high. So all these are plus points for gratings. Especially when you compare with prisms, prisms do not give equal dispersion. They give non-linear dispersion. Why? Because they disperse the shorter wavelengths more than the longer wavelengths. 
the resolving power of prisms is less uh, much poor compared to that of gratings and the intensity of radiation is also much greater for gratings and uh, if you're talking about ir then you have one more uh, advantage uh, and that is the gratings uh, in case of ir especially if you're talking about transmission gratings you will be making them with alkali halides which get damaged by moisture in atmosphere whereas uh, the prisms sorry the prisms get damaged uh, they will be made up of alkali halides so they very easily get damaged uh, due to more effect of moisture in the atmosphere but uh, if you're uh, using gratings then we and especially if you're using reflection gratings and the top surface is always aluminium which does not get affected by moisture in atmosphere so it's more durable compared to prisms in ir and that's another reason why in case of ir uh, it is gratings uh, are the monochromators of choice Grating monochromators are preferred compared to prisms. Prisms are nowadays not used uh, in present day instruments. But for UV visible, that advantage is not there because the quartz or glass also does not get affected by moisture in atmosphere. Uh, these were the these were the advantages of gratings now we will come to the disadvantage of gratings gratings produce radiation at multiples of incident radiation which are called the higher orders of radiation now i'll try to explain the orders of radiation say here you have this is a picture where you have been shown a transmission grating but you could also have a reflective uh, grating then you will have to instead of drawing this incident light like this you'll have to draw the incident light here so it falls here and it gets reflected the same way okay um, we are not interested in that whether reflection or transmission we are interested in this dispersion the deflected beams that are formed whether by reflection or by transmission okay so here you have one wavelength what we have to study till now is the wavelengths are separated uh, because they get dispersed at different angles. So here, for example, you have 100 nanometer, 200, 300, and 400, all coming out at different angles. So if your exit slit is at this point, then you will have 400 nanometer coming out. If it is at this point, at this angle, then it's 300. If the exit slit is here and you rotate the um, grating, then 200 will come out at the same place. Okay, I hope that is all clear. Now, in case of gratings, at a particular angle, what I told 100, 200, 300, 400, these are the first order radiation. Apart from first order radiation, you also get higher orders, that is second order, third order, fourth order, and so on. What is second order radiation? It corresponds to half the wavelength of first order. And it will be obtained at the same angle as the first order radiation. So if 100 nanometer is coming out at this angle, this is 100 nanometer first order radiation. You will also have half the wavelength that is 50 nanometer, 50 nanometer second order radiation coming at the same angle. You will also have 100 divided by 3, that's 33.3 third order radiation 33.3 .3 nanometer third order radiation coming at the same angle then you have 100 divided by 4 that's 25 so 25 nanometer will also come out at the same angle this 25 nanometer is the fourth order radiation and fifth order radiation will be 100 by 5 that's 20 so 20 nanometer also comes out at the same angle but that's all fifth order so all these are higher orders this is the primary or first order so what you notice here is first order will be the highest wavelength half of it that means a, a smaller value will be second still lesser that is one third of the first will be third order one fourth one fifth all of these come at the same angle so if you have an exit slit at this angle you will see 
not only 100 nanometer, you also see 50, 33.3, 25, and 20 nanometers coming through. That's a wide range, 100 to 20 nanometer is a very wide range of wavelengths. And 20 nanometer may be absorbed by something other than the sample. This is just an example. It doesn't correspond to UV visible radiation, but an example. If you see here, it corresponds to UV visible. So 400 nanometer is visible radiation. So at this angle, you will get 400 nanometer. Naturally, you'll keep uh, the rating in such a position. Your exit slit is here. So 400 nanometer comes through. But at this angle, you will also see 200 nanometer of second order, 133.3 nanometer third order, 100 nanometer fourth order, and 80 nanometer fifth order radiations coming through. So you not only have 400 nanometer, you have all these wavelengths coming through. And your sample will be specifically absorbing 400 and say 100 or 80 may be absorbed by something else in solution. It could be solvent also. So this is how errors are created. But this is the disadvantage of grating because it always produces higher orders of radiation. Now, what uh, can be done is these higher orders can be removed. If you remove these higher orders from the incident radiation, then at this angle, you will get only 400 nanometer. That is what is practically done. Great, since gratings produce, this is another representation. Here you have the incident beam and this is reflection. Then you also have... Uh, diffractions of the first order, here it comes out at this angle. There is no spread indicated here. Then you see second order, then you see third order and so on. If you see here, you get a much better picture. Here you have the incident radiation and this is the zero order, that is reflected radiation. And these are the various diffracted patterns. So here you have first order diffraction you see the spread blue to red. This is on the other side. So if you, this is what we will be considering. So this is first order radiation, blue to red. You see the second order, blue to red. And then you see the third order. What is? What do you observe here? The spread is much less for first order. It is more for second order. And it is still more for third order. Okay, if the spread is more, the individual wavelengths are well separated. That means resolution of the individual wavelengths is much greater with higher orders. But why is the first order preferred? You will see first order is not being interfered by any other order. But here you see the second order from this blue to this red. That is second order. Here there is an overlapping of the third order. So partly it is getting overlapped by third order. So uh, if you measure at this point, you don't get red alone. You get red with a little blue. So mixed up with blue of third order. So you don't get monochromatic radiation. You get more than one wavelength if you try to measure the second order. Similarly with third order because you have a fourth order after it. So the fourth order will start somewhere here. More overlapping will be seen. As you go to higher and higher orders, though the spread is more, the overlapping with the next order will also be more. And that is why the higher orders are not preferred. We prefer the first order. And it is also easy to remove higher orders rather than removing the lower order. So what is done? To eliminate higher orders, radiation of wavelengths less than the spectral region of interest must be filtered out. So if you want, say, 400 nanometers, as I showed here, you want 400 nanometers, you have to filter out all radiation from 399 and lesser. You want to measure only 400 or higher than 400, you will filter out less than 400 nanometers. So 399 onwards should be filtered out. 
optical filters that pass radiation only above a certain wavelength are required. So these are called the cutoff filters. So you will see when you are when you use the instrument, I will show you where the cutoff filter is there and how we choose the cutoff filter because it will vary from wavelength to wavelength because for 400, a cutoff filter will be uh, less than 400. Whereas if you're measuring at 600, your cutoff filter cannot be less than 300, be, uh, less than 400. It has to be less than 600 because if it is less than 400, that uh, in 600 nanometer, you will get second order radiation or third order radiation will come through. Okay, so you have to, or 800 nanometers, 400 will be the second order radiation. So you have to always have a cutoff filter suitable for the wavelength at which you are making a measurement. So what is a cutoff filter? It is a filter that filters out all radiations lower than or shorter than the required wavelength. This is not only done uh, achieved with filters but you can also do it with prisms so prisms can also be acting the same way as cutoff filters to remove all shorter wavelengths of radiation in order to prevent lower orders of radiation so these type of prisms will be called order sorters sorting out orders okay they are called order sorters and order sorters are a must in IR instrument and like I told before prisms are used but not for the purpose of, uh, of selecting wavelength or as a wavelength selector but it is used as an order sorter to remove the higher orders coming from a grating. So that is the purpose of uh, prism uh, in IR instruments. In UV visible you can have many times uh, filters are used. So cutoff filters can be used, but also some instruments do have prisms. The more expensive instruments may have prisms as order sorters. So these are the two dispersive devices we have discussed today. Prisms giving non-linear dispersion and they are temperature sensitive, whereas gratings, uh, linear dispersion and their disadvantage, major disadvantage is different orders are obtained. Of course, we can. Uh, overcome this disadvantage. That's why gratings are the preferred wavelength selectors in UV visible instruments. And the last part of the monochromator are the two slits, entrance slit and exit slits. They are also important to some extent because the effective bandwidth of a monochromator depends on the dispersion by the prism of grating and also on the width of the slits. So narrow slits, if you keep the slits narrow, then it will give narrow bandwidth and higher instrument resolution. Hence, you will also get greater spectral detail. So what is the problem? Narrow slit widths, however, reduce the intensity of radiation. So you have to uh, take an entire view before making the slits very narrow. Yes, narrower the slits, you get better instrument resolution, your specificity, everything will increase, your monochromaticity of radiation will increase, but also the intensity of radiation will reduce. And that's why you have to consider both these aspects and take a compromise and keep the slit width accordingly. Generally, the entrance and exit slits are kept uh, same but it is possible to have them different also. So today uh, we'll stop here. So do you have any questions?